Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, my name is Lei Liang. I'm a, a composer and professor of music here. Uh, before I introduce our distinguished guest and my colleague, I would like to welcome Professor Victor Shi, who is the director of China Center. Uh, China Center is responsible for sponsoring today's event. Professor Shi. Hi, uh, I'm Victor Shi. I'm the director of the 21st Century China Center here at UCSD. For those of you who don't know, uh, we are a data-driven policy uh, think tank which looks at uh, both dynamics within China and also U.S.-China relationship. Uh, of course, typically we don't do a lot of cultural events, but one of our core missions is to facilitate mutual understanding between the U.S. and China. And of course, there's uh, really nothing better than to understand the culture of one another. Uh, so we're very happy to have partners like Professor Lei Liang here to facilitate these cultural events because the closest I get to culture is, you know, when I play my electric guitar, which uh, badly. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm uh, very happy to be here uh, for some very uh, good art here. Uh, for those of you who are interested in our other events, you can go to china.ucsd.edu to look at our future events. Uh, we have weekly events um, as well as, you know, sometimes even larger symposiums. Uh, and uh, I guess here I will hand things back to Professor Lei Liang and I very much look forward to the performance uh, and the Zhou Wenzhong lecture also. Thank you so much. I just want to mention one thing about uh, the last part that Professor Shi mentioned. Uh, this lecture series is called Chou Wen Chong, Distinguished Lecture Series. It's named after a mutual friend of ours, uh, dear Professor Chou Wen Chong, who really was the very first um, Chinese American composer who made it in the world. Uh, the most, uh, the earliest uh, uh, generation composer who really pioneered so much work. He served as dean at Columbia University and all these things that uh, Wu Man's good friends back in the Central Conservatory in Beijing uh, were inspired by him. Um, uh, Professor Cho was uh, the chair of the composition program at Columbia for many years, and in that role, he changed the American music scene because uh, many important uh, composers, also Wu Man's dear friends, Chen Yi, Zhou Long, Tan Dun, Bright Sheng, they all came to America because of Professor Cho. Uh, so, um, and Steve is a champion of Professor Cho's music, and we're very, very grateful for Professor Cho's family donation to our uh, university with an incredible collection of percussion instruments. And um, so, uh, thank, thank him for, for all of this. And um, I want to uh, introduce our friends. I really um, doesn't need introduction, but I, I would probably say this. Um, that uh, Wu Man's name has become synonymous with Pipa. Uh, we talk about Pipa, and the first thing we think about, the first name we think about is Wu Man. And this is really quite extraordinary because we know about many important Pipa players before Wu Man. Uh, we might talk about some of them. Um, they laid the foundation uh, for uh, preserving traditional art, elevating it. Um, and teaching it to next generation like Wu Man, but it was really Wu Man was the first who made it on the world stage. Uh, that not only um, sharing traditional Chinese music that most of us have never heard of. I, can, I think Pipa was probably a name that nobody had heard of before you came to America probably. And now we all know about this instrument. But not only partnered with um, uh, famous ensembles like Silk Road and. Uh, all of those uh, uh, important institutions and groups, but Wu Man has worked with so many composers like Lou Harrison and, and you know, Philip Glass. All these people are part of it. This is unprecedented. No, no one has ever done such things <laughs> for Pipa. Um, and so um, I, I think we have the distinct honor of welcoming Wu Man today when she has just become the most recent recipient of the National Heritage Fellowship which is the highest honor and the first Asian artist to receive this honor. And lastly, I want to say a few words of my dear friend and colleague, Stephen Schick. Uh, again, Stephen Schick is a, a name that has become synonymous with percussion. Um, and 
more than that, uh, in San Diego, we have been very lucky to have Steve because he has been served as, serving as the director of La Jolla Symphony and bringing so many concerts playing with San Diego Symphony, but also in Carnegie Hall, in uh, San Francisco, contemporary players. He himself has alone commissioned more than 150 um, new compositions that changed the repertoire for percussion, and he played most of them, if not all of them, from memory. So um, Steve is a national treasure. I'm so grateful to be here with Steve and welcome our dear friend Wu Man. Um, I thought today's structure is gonna be like this. Uh, think of this as a, a, a special treat. This is not a concert. Um, I know it's inconvenient for people who <laughs> want to come here for evening, uh, but this is a very private event in a way that we, we are sharing this, uh, have a chance to have a close face-to-face -face encounter with Wu Man and I would love it if you can uh, ask questions and interact with Wuman. But I thought maybe we can have two uh, subjects. One is Wuman herself as a very unique player, as a person who has gone through a very special experience. Um, that will be the first half, and then we'll move on to the instrument itself. Pipa is a very, very special instrument. We can talk about that, and we will, uh, around five o'clock or so, uh, if we can finish the question and answer, Uman and Steve will perform a piece that I wrote for them. Uh, that will be the final act of this today's. So, um, so let's begin. Um, <laughs> I know, take a deep breath now. <laughs> it's almost as if uh, this is a story that is impossible until your lifetime. You grew up in China, that was very much in the Cultural Revolution. You got all those trainings. And before you left China, you've already studied with the most important P-pop masters. Uh, I would just name two of them, Lin Shicheng mm -hmm. at the Central Conservatory and Liu Dehai at the China Conservatory. What was it like for you to work with these great musicians? And what would you say about um, their mentorship Perhaps in hindsight, as someone who has also got so much experience in America, what do you think the Chinese teachers taught that was a really interesting lesson for you? Um, thank you for asking. Uh, first thing is, um, well, when I, when I started when I was nine years old and I started picking up an instrument, and uh, which is a much smaller version, we call Liu Qing. Some of you maybe know that small version of pipa, like a mandolin. And then uh, when I was 12, and my Liu Qing teacher said, okay, that's it, I, I, you know, I already taught everything. You played everything, let's move on, let's move to the bigger one. So I have to find a different teacher. Um, teacher to me, um, and first of all, I have a private teacher. My, my father is a friend. Um, he just, you know, he saw me singing, you know, walking, and said, oh, Lao Wu, and okay. call my dad, uh, like, old Wu. Uh, <laughs> your, your daughter seems like a very talent. There's music talent. And when, when she's singing, she was very in tune, very musical. So I can, you know, I can teach her, her instrument for free. So my dad, of course, at that time, it, it is free. Um, the tuition is my teacher will come to my house, have a weekend, have a dinner. Yep. That's it. Um, so when I went to music school in Beijing, uh, Yue Xue Yuan, uh, Conservatory, um, as you mentioned, uh, uh, Professor Ling, Professor Liu, um, Professor Ling, he, he's, he older than my dad. He, to me, like he's a grandpa at uh, that time, uh, more like that. And uh, he take care, of us, uh, take care of me, not only the, the, you know, to study, but also you know, always checking on me, like did I uh, you know, practice enough? Or uh, how, if I got cold, he will uh, give me some kind of medicine. Uh, so more like a father type. And that's the relationship uh, in China when I, my generation. Yeah. I, I've heard such stories about these older generation teachers who are so generous. Um, uh, Lin in particular, he would pay a student's uh, application fee 
or uh, go out to discover a, a talented uh, student on, on a farm and, and would do everything to help the student. And once you're taken in, you're really part of the family in a way. But he can also be very uh, demanding. Oh, he never smiled. <laughs> oh, very seriously. Um, if I play well, uh, you know, at the exam or big competition, I win a competition in China, and he will came to me like, good job. <laughs> That's it. That means he's very happy, already very, very happy. Good job. That, that is rare to come from Lin himself. If he gave you two words, that... <laughs> um, do you still think of them when you do all these amazing things today, playing with Indian musicians, Persian musicians, and, and what do you think these teachers actually, will be saying to you? Yeah, actually, sorry. Actually, all the time, mm. every time I'm on the stage um, after concert, I, you know, apparently I just had a solo recital at the UCLA. I played 12 pieces nonstop, an hour and a half, just by myself. And I, when I walk out, my, my teachers just come, came out to me, his face. Um, all the time, um, sometimes if, if the piece I played, he taught me. Uh, or sometimes something happened on the stage, like uh, my, another teacher, Liu Dehai, also I will think how he will deal with that if I broke a string or something, you know. Uh, it, teacher is always, with with a student, we don't. I don't say all the time, but it's it's somehow it's always always there. That's beautiful. I don't think I've heard you say that, but it's very very touching. And in some way, Liu Dehai is uh, he is very unique in the Chinese pipa tradition in terms of he he has composed so many pieces, added to the repertoire, and now you are publishing your own works and also recording your own compositions. I think one of them also got the Grammy and all of that. Liu um, Dehai must have been part of that as well. Big influence, yeah. Big, big influence, yes. When I was um, studying with him, Liu Dehai, and he's, he, he, in his um, later 40s, he already started writing music mm -hmm. himself. So he, some, you know, someday I walked in his studio, I mean, basically his home, and um, he will hand me a paper with all the notes and say, play. <laughs> you know, I'm like, <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, I like, he said, try, try. So I played, oh, so weird, you know, this <laughs> technique is something. He said, oh, uh, oh, oh, that works, that not work. And the next, next lesson, he came again, another paper. Uh, so, and then become a piece, which is he kind of led me to really inspire me. Like, oh, this is the piece in your, your writing. He said, yes. So there's a piece called Tian Le. Yes, very he, famous one, yeah. So that was did. the piece Yes. you were, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah this piece is anyway. called Swan. <laughs> That might be the first composer performance kind of collaboration you had to think about it. Uh, I had no idea Liu Dehai would give you notation because this is the other part of the question I wanted to ask is how music is transmuted, how, how trans, uh, transmitted, how, how it's taught. Um, in, uh, in China, by the time I was trained at the conservatory, most of the traditional Chinese pieces are notated in cipher notations. You see numbers one, two, three, four, five, as do, re, mi, fa, so. Uh, we didn't use uh, Western notation, but of course you learn all of that from cipher notation. Uh, now, of course, the piece that you were playing with D, for example, I notated in, in, in staff notation, Western style. Um, but a lot of it is also just by, by route. You, you are there listening, watching. How was how was music taught to you that you felt was the best lesson in terms of getting what's the essence of music? Um, oral tradition, um, singing. singing, singing. That's the most for student to get the, the style, get the, you know, everything. It's just singing, most the teacher, um, when they singing, I can get sense, I can um, imitate 
that on my instrument. Um, like say my, my uh, teacher Lin Shichen, because sometimes he later 70s, some, some technique he couldn't really play, um, you know, hands or something. So he will say, oh, here you just do da, da, da. Hmm. Oh, so I will know, oh, dear, boom, boom, hmm. something like that. So just sing to you. And I, this is, I lo learn a lot. Now I teach my student, I will always ask them, singing, sing to me. Put the instrument down. Sing first. I love that. This applies well to what's called the lyric style, mm. the wen xu. But what about the martial style? <laughs> Do you sing the, <laughs> the, 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 the ambush or the battles? That, that was also sung by the masters when they were teaching you? Um, if you see the, um, there's a piece of Shimei Mai Fu, ambush, that's kind of famous martial style pipa. If you're looking at the, the older score, a lot of a skeleton notation. Yes. Yeah, there is not much detail um, about the, the pipa uh, uh, fingering thing. So that part you have to learn from your master. Uh, in the older days, you know, people just want to, you come to me, listen, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you learn from, with me, you know, if, if only from the paper you cannot get anything. A secret recipe. Yes, yeah. it, okay. exactly. Would, yeah. you, would you be able to demonstrate a little bit what the score might look like and what the teacher might tell you what to do? Okay. Oh, I <laughs> you mean the Marshall style thing? Sure. Oh, just to say, if, if, we have, if we have this, if you see the note notation, it's just like that. Sometimes it's like, something like that, just the notes, yeah. right? Um, but if you teacher tell, oh no, you have to add your um. left hand. kind of detail. Wow. <laughs> That's the good stuff. <laughs> That's all missing uh, from, from the notation in a way. <laughs> there must be so many things that um, um, get lost because of use of notation. And I wonder if what you have just talked about, the singing, uh, the intonations, uh, things teaching outside of what's actually written in the score that needs to be entering our consciousness when we teach music. Because uh, our training has been kind of looking for things on the score um, and try to be faithful to the score, but what you're describing is a very different experience. It's things that are outside of the score, like what you just play. The most interesting things are actually not in the score. Um. Here is another example. Another example. Um, let's say um, because in chi Chinese, I I always before I learn Western notation, it's always jian pu, right? It's always the Chinese separate notation. notation. Yes, yeah, separate yeah, notation. Separate. But my head, in my head, also jian pu, hmm. the movable do. Yes. So the do re mi fa sol la ti, and if you say. D major, do re mi fa sol la ti. If it's G major, do re mi fa sol la ti. Everything is do re mi fa sol la ti. <laughs> it's not like a sol la ti, do re mi fa. It's not like yeah. that. So um, here, if you look at the score. Nope, this is my, this is my function. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at it, pretty much hip hop music, right? Yes. Uh, so. We sing it, it's a mi so mi re, mi so mi re, do re mi so mi re, do la do so la do. It's not fa da fa mi re mi fa. That's, that's, you, you know, that's the... The fixed though. Fixed though. Right. It, it's different. So, but for me, another notation is why we singing, we will sing. Mm. See, that's the different. Yeah. But that kind of a notation, how? Yes. How? <laughs> this is very, very hard, actually. Singing, oh. you, you listen, That's you right. know the style. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I do remember Lin Shi Cheng, uh, the, the teacher who is very demanding and loving. Uh, that master, uh, I did talk to him 
uh, a year before he, he passed away, and he talked so much about um, the right hand is certainly very impressive and important, but the flavor is all in the left hand uh, with all this vibrato. Or oh, the flavors or the ornamentation, all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, and just like what you said, it's, it's very important to, to be able to sing it um, in here. So I, I, here's another thing I think is very unusual about your collaboration that I think is, again, unprecedented. Uh, unprecedented. Um, you have worked with so many composers but you have also worked with performers that pipa player didn't have a chance to work with before. Like with this, like movie. Steve. <laughs> yes, and as, actually, I only found out today that you have known each other for so long. Um, <laughs> can you tell us what, when you met and, and what was that like? We we met. Uh, I think it was the Bang and a Can collaboration. So I was a percussionist with the Bang and a Can All Stars from 1992 to 2002. And someplace in the middle of that, I don't remember the year, we did a big project with Brian Eno, uh, built around his music for airports. And I frankly I associate Wuman and Pipa together because they came through the door at the same moment, and it was amazing. <laughs> And uh, Brian liked it, everyone liked it, and it's on, you were on that, the, the recording. We did some touring together. And then in, in the meantime, we've just found ways to play together kind of regularly. We played together at the Ojai Festival when I was music director. We played to, to, at the La Jolla Symphony, right. uh, Breckenridge Festival, different right. places. Right. And so, yeah, I think it goes back now uh, nearly 30 years, our friendship and professional relationship. Well, it's very unusual for any pipa player to even play outside of the traditional Chinese ensemble. Um, now it's becoming a little bit more common, their repertoire for, let's say, pipa and string quartet or concertos, and those are all new things. But what you have done, I mean, Steve is here as an example, is that how do you work with somebody, um, you know, you communicate differently, not even the language, but, you know, the score you look at is different. I mean, all these years of working together, you have evolved as well, what you feel comfortable. Can I ask, I'd love to know about your work with Lou and with the concerto that came from the Harrison. Uh, you know, so what, what was that like? Because I think it's such a wonderful piece. Yeah, the Lou Harrison Pipa Concerto, um, uh, basically, I think the first American composer wrote this piece with, uh, with Pipa. Uh, Pipa and the string orchestra, Steve conducted with the La Jolla Symphony. Um, when 1996 lose right, wrote this, 1997 premiered in Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. See, way back. Uh, wow. <laughs> Getting old. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, that time, you know, we, we, we don't have no cell phone. No. Uh, even no computer yet. I don't remember a computer. Probably just to start the computer. Um, Lou wrote the first page. Well, the occasion is was Dennis Russell Davis, you know, conductor. He's Lou friends, also Philip's friends, Philip Glass friend. So he thought Lou is great person to write um, for China, Chinese instrument or Asian instrument, because Lou, um, early years he spent in San Francisco, a lot of time he played in the Chinese ensemble in San Francisco, Chinatown. So he kind of familiar with that language, which, which we'll talk about the style of the language. Um, so Lou wrote the first page, faxed me. <laughs> like early morning, my fax machine, and here is the score, and the loose handwriting, yeah, beautiful. very beautiful, mm. and then I checked, here is that. <laughs> <laughs> that brings back good memories. Yeah, so it's interesting because this is definitely not Chinese music, right? We're not very different. B flat. Sometimes he does. Uh -huh. So very. And then the Lu uh, called me, said, uh, "Is this okay? The scale? It's a, it's not Chinese." And Lou specifically told me, said, you know, I don't have any Chinese background. 
I don't know the culture that well, but I want to write something I want to, which is I understand my music, my style. So I, I was very happy. I said, Lou, this is what exactly I wanted. I want to see uh, non-Chinese composer, you know, the composer from, a, uh, from a outside the community and how they look at the instrument. It's like a Chinese, like you write a symphony. Symphony definitely not Chinese tradition. You write a piece for piano. Piano is not Chinese instrument, right? So basically the same thing. If, if this Asian composer writes something, definitely have their own culture language in the piece. Doesn't matter what instrument they write, right? Your piano or violin, sometimes they ask violin, something like erhu. Right, a lot of the time. Uh, it's the same thing to me, like, okay, I want to hear. So it's definitely their banjo quality there. Uh, so, so since then, the piece is getting very popular. I play many times, yeah. I mean, that is the definition of an instrument. I mean, instrument as a carrier of anything that you can put into it. <laughs> you know, we've been sitting here and talking for about half an hour, and I thought you probably crave to hear some performance. I see some nodding heads. <laughs> what, what if we invite Steve and Wu Man to play something together? Now, let me just say that uh, Wu Man will play, and I will do my best to play <laughs> with her. The totality of our rehearsal is that when she looks at me, I stop. And we talk about the, you know, the, the flavor, yes. the, the ornamentation. Uh, this is a very much pentatonic piece. Uh, San Liu, three and six. It's like tea house music from my hometown.
That was fun. No, this is I believe this was the moment that inspired me to write the piece that uh, our audience will hear today. Um, it was at the end of a performance of Lou Harrison Concerto with yeah. La Jolla Symphony. Not exactly the same, of course, but something about that chemistry that I witnessed in the audience that the two of them is not just a pipa and percussion, it's Wu Man and Steve Schick. Um, and, and that made me feel, there is something about that I have to write a piece about, so that took me a few years to write, but, but you will hear that uh, later today. Um, let me slightly change gear here. Uh, I think we can talk for a few more minutes, but we want to open up to the questions or for all of you, if you can, um, uh, if you want to ask anything. I just want to talk about the pipa instrument a little bit because it's such an amazing instrument. Um, I can, um, let me just quote one amazing um, uh, Gu Jin master, Wu Jing Lue. Uh, Gu Jin is a Chinese uh, pluck string instrument. Um, and he said that Gu Jin in itself is an orchestra. Just one instrument is an orchestra. And I mean, in a very subtle way, of course, if we listen to Gu Qin very carefully, you understand what he said. But there's no better example than pipa for that metaphor. Uh, I just want to call your attention to you know, the, the great contrast between Western music training and what Wu Man represent in, in Asian music. Um, we probably, let's say, practice violin uh, do everything we can to get rid of all the noises. We try to get that sound as pure as possible, but that's what we train for, right? But for woman, um, peepod itself, there's nothing that cannot be musical. Everything is musical, including all the noises. You've heard some interesting noises already. I mean, uh, maybe you can demonstrate uh, <laughs> anything. How about the sound of wind? Yes, and how about the sound of swords and, you know, things like that. <laughs> what about horse neighing and... <laughs> Nothing's <laughs> impossible. Name it, anything you can think of. Uh, maybe cannons. What about cannons? Can you make sound of a cannon oh, and... There's an ambush. <laughs> Anything is possible. <laughs> yeah. So uh, part of what? <laughs> yes, we have to be gentle with it. it, it the, the thing is that I have experienced uh, today, this morning, I had the uh, pleasure of working with Steve and Wuman, uh, recording my piece, and and you know this setting itself is very telling. We have all these percussion instruments on one side, and Wuman has just one little loot <laughs> next to her, but you somehow have to engage in an equal dialogue. Uh, but that's what this instrument is possible, what is, what is capable of, is, is to project all these different things. But um, what perhaps is really something for us to think a little bit more is that all of these noises that come with the pipa can become musical gestures, can become intentional, well-crafted musical gestures that can be found at the right place just to express the right feeling. And this has been something that took generations of musicians like yourself um, to craft, and I, I think that's very, very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah because uh, different styles. Yeah. We have different styles. So the, the noisy you just heard, uh, you mentioned that those uh, mostly from those martial sort of style piece. So it, a lot of imitated different sound. Yes. In, that's all actually all in the music piece. That's yes. right, that's right. You know, my question, let me just ask you one last question. I, 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 I want to preface this by saying that um, uh, I'm so grateful for China Center for offering us a chance to have a dialogue like this because I think if Wu Man and I were sitting on stage in China, there are certain things we just can't discuss. Uh, but here, we're in San Diego, we can. That's why I want to pose you the next question. What so, are you going to ask? <laughs> <laughs> what is the thing that is the most difficult in terms of preserving the Chinese musical heritage in China? 
Well, it is. <laughs> uh, of course, I was thinking. To, you know. to my experience, yep. um, when I was in China, I did not really care about it when I was little, because I really didn't know more a lot, you know, more about it. Um, I just tried to learn the instrument. What's the history behind? How many masters? What's you know? This is this is a very old instrument. Um, so, lot of lot of things is when you left. It's like my my hometown, Hangzhou, is the most beautiful city. Uh, Hangzhou, Xihu, uh, a lot West of people Lake. know. Yeah. When I live in Hangzhou, my the city I grew up, right next to the lake. I didn't think like it's that beautiful. Yeah. I just didn't pay attention. When I left, when I went to Beijing, I miss Hangzhou a lot. Food, mm. everything. It's the same thing like when I left and I had a great opportunity to work with you know, musician Steve or with the different musicians and uh, um, especially work with a lot of traditional mu uh, uh, musicians like Aboriginal musician or African musician or Central Asia musician, Indian musician. That gives me sort of hit me like, what is my tradition? What is pipa? What 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 this instrument? You know where the pipa come from? Where what's the history? What's the sound? So I'm very curious uh, about the history. I think the most challenge right now is modern days in China. Most young, younger generation, they don't care about tradition. That's why it's so difficult to keep on that. And also the older generation already passed away. My teachers, my, all my teachers already passed away. So there is not, there's a gap between, um, but I think this happened not only in China, probably many country, and um, so I think it's that's the that's the, I don't know if that makes sense to answer your question. So that's the most challenge um, to me to um, keep this the tradition, how to inspire the younger generation, younger people player to really understand the instrument, and not only just play the notes to be a more musical, what is the Chinese music? What is the, this instrument's musical language? What is pipa's language? That's more important to me. It's beautiful, yeah, thank you. I, I think I, I resonate with that greatly because I've also left China and realized it's a little bit like finally seeing a mirror yeah. and I can start to look at myself, yeah. I, I don't have anything to say. Um, but I have the microphone in my hand, Me too. and I just wonder if yeah. I, I, I wonder if I could say a little bit about uh, in, in terms of transitioning between this conversation and the piece that people will uh, hear vis-a-vis, -vis, um, which I think could be interesting. At least it's interesting this transition for me, because when you wrote the piece "Trans" for me, which is the solo that was written for my 60th birthday now 10 years ago, and uh, it was a really important piece. But the score and the, the way the material was shaped was so ephemeral. The, the sense wasn't that the piece resided on the page, that there was this ability to transit amongst all of these different kinds of sounds. So that the job of the performer is to carve a path through the score to figure this out. And it's a little bit like what we're doing here. I'm reminded of a, a colleague now retired, Ed Harkins, who would come up to you and say, here's Arnold Schoenberg. He would give you a handshake. And he would be able to trace through various people the source of the handshake. And it was originally Schoenberg. You know? And so I, this is all fun. You know, I have a Richard Nixon. I mean, that's not something super to be proud of. But in, in any event, we all can think about like how many handshakes between us and Brahms, for example. But where does the handshake get stored in the meantime? Right? Where does this wisdom that you're passing along get stored? And I realized with your piece, Trans, and I think it's the same with vis-a-vis, -vis, that, that the wisdom is not stored on the page. It is stored in a combination of the materials that we use, the instruments, and in the bodies of the people that, that learn them. And so there is not just the acceptance, but almost the requirement that the piece will morph between different performances to reflect not just 
the changing of the mind, but the changing of the body as well. You know, with the solo, uh, I play the piece differently because I am a different person, my body is different, my memory is different, my touch on the instrument is different, and I know that you and I have played this piece vis-a-vis, -vis the duo, I, I can't re really remember, I think it's six years old or something like that. Yeah, I think it's, so. It's always longer than you think with the pandemic. And, and uh, I think this piece has changed. We pick it up after having worked on it mm, years ago, and it, it's there because it exists someplace in our experiences and our bodies and minds. So I think that's a way to listen to this mu music in a way. Thank you. And in fact, today, uh, in the uh, end of the recording session, I, I've never felt this way, but toward the end of the recording session, I really felt this piece has nothing to do with me anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I, I hope that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. Okay. Now, Please. Uh, I think uh, we have some time for the audience to interact with. Uh, so next 15, uh, 20 minutes, if, if you have a question, please. Sir. Yes, please. We don't have microphones down there. Oh, we do. So that's great. If you can pass one microphone over here. In fact, if you can just reach us. You know, Thank you so much, and I um, really enjoy everything you did there. And Lele, you've been talking about this piece that this morning you've been, you guys have been doing together. Would you please, Grace? Uh, us to play a little bit of that? We'll play the entire of it. Whether, whether you like it or not, <laughs> you will hear the piece. Right there. <laughs> That's, I'm sit, gonna be sit there. Oh, yeah. You'll do later? Okay, yes. I don't have questions. <laughs> That's good, a question. Hi, um, beautiful playing. Thanks so much for everything. I'm curious about the, some of the physical techniques that you're using um, and how they might differ from other plucked strings. So do you use the, like for the right hand, are you exclusively using back of nail for the tremolo? Or do you, all, do you use the inward strike as well? Um, can you just maybe talk a little bit about the, the techniques for the pipa? Clearly, there's somebody who plays guitar. So. <laughs> and maybe how it differentiates from the classical guitar. <laughs> so the red hand technique? Yeah. What's the... Um, yeah, I, I use all the five fingernails put on my five, it's kind of like plastic fingernails and I put on my five fingers. Um, that's my right hand, but it's a different, the, the way I play is a different than guitar. Guitar mostly on the mid side, but pipa is all on the nail side. So everything is going out. Uh, sometimes we do something like... That's okay, but mostly... Is out, the tremolo is out, like a flamingo guitar. So, and then two, finger, two fingers. So uh, looked kind of easy, but it's really demanding instrument. <laughs> it doesn't look bad. No, okay. Uh, yeah, so every time I have to put on my fingernails to play. Um, natural fingernails grow. Uh, yes, my, my teacher's generation, they did. Um, so that's another, another um, about the instrument. Um, in the 19th century, early 20th century, we all still use the silk strings, much softer. And uh, that's why and all my teachers, they use natural fingernails, their natural fingernails. And then this metal string right now, steel strings, um, starts in uh, the 60s in 60s, so you see the sound much louder because we want to play for you know, more people. Um, and then that's why um, the pipa master, they invented, actually my teacher, um, they invented this, this plastic fingernails and the way to play. So I grew up, when I learned, this is the way I learned. Yeah. Thank you. Phyllis, did you, you had a, your hand up. Would you pass that, thank you. Thanks. Um, I was curious about if there's a typical um, person that plays it, meaning men and women, was it unusual as a girl for you to play this? And is it something that both women and men play? Yeah. Um, um, right now, it's getting, getting that kind of uh, all women play. 
uh, this instrument. But uh, in my teacher's generation, if you see the, the history of pipa master, they all male, they're not female. Um, but uh, somehow you see the painting, they're all female. <laughs> <laughs> They are goddess, you know, flying, carrying the instrument, the Buddha, you know. But mostly, people mastered in the history uh, in in nineteenth century. They all men. Um, so the women get popular. It starts eighties, and it's, um, my generation, and uh, after that, and getting more and more women play. What well, well, my parents asked, they like they like this instrument. They thought this kind of you know in this shape very beautiful, elegant. That's probably the one reason. <laughs> oh, sure. And then over there. Yeah. <laughs> Can you give us a quick tour of the notes and how they relate to how the the frets relate? How the frets relate? The way we play very much like a play guitar or banjo. Um, you put a finger between the frets. Um, the tune, tuning, open string. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> I practiced the scale. <laughs> Hi, so you mentioned during uh, when you were talking that your perspective on the instrument changed as you left China and in seeing other kinds of music more deeply, you got a better insight into the pipa. Could you tell us a bit more about what you learned about the instrument, how you learned to see it in a different perspective through this different environment? Hmm. Um. I think to me, um, you know, later we're gonna play Liang um, Lei's piece. You, uh, that's a different style. Um, first of all, um, there, there's two different things I learned. First thing is how you uh, collaborate with a different instrument, um, collaborate with it from different, you know, cultural background. So first of all, you have have to understand their instrument their language and then and then you will know understand how my people could fit in where is the balance between i mean i mean musically not the, the you know like i understand the drum the you know the marimba the different so how we how people sound could fit in but also if i play with the indian musician so what the raga the style the, the skill i have to learn and then the, the language, the, 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 the vibrato things. Um, this is the one thing I learned, which is I never learned in China. So that means that at the same time, I deeply understand, more understand my instrument. And uh, um, that's, I think, and secondly, um, I feel like I more and more like my, <laughs> love my instrument because I think the personality is so strong. When I sit next to guitar or mandolin, I could beat them up. <laughs> <laughs> that was joking, sorry. <laughs> Can we pass the mic to the gentleman in the middle? And then the question over there. Any questions Hi. on this side? Uh, I have, um, my questions is uh, maybe two prong. One is, are there different tunings in the tradition of ways of tuning the pipa in, in the tradition? And secondly, since you've been collaborating with uh, so many musicians and, and, and composers, has the need to try different tunings come up? And if so, that's a third question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and if so, how does change? How does that change what you do in the in, in on the pipa? And 
has that led to different discoveries to have a musical narrative and you know based on extending some of these technical abilities of the instrument um, thank you for asking um, the the tuning um, actually uh, some co mostly composers will stay with this traditional tuning um, but we have a different tuning with the composer, I always, um, doesn't matter how, you know, modern or, 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 sorry, or to me is the, the language of the instrument I have to hold on. That's what I feel. Um, doesn't matter uh, how modern, you know, how different sound, some technique. I don't looking for different technique. I think it's enough. Um, people had enough technique. <laughs> I don't want to make make life more difficult. <laughs> um, so I think it's mostly keep the this pipa style, the pipa language, in this modern piece. So have their own have the role of the instrument, not lost. I don't want to imitate the guitar. Uh, that's that's what I'm I'm trying to do. Does that make sense? One question over here, and then uh, you can pass, pass the mic. I have a question. Is, uh, just like Gu Qing right now, so many people want to go back to use the silk strands because they think that more representative to the old style. And you also mentioned the pipa in the old, old time is used the silk strands. Is a lot of people, people talking about they want to go back to use the silk strands? Use old um, uh, silk strings. Yeah. Right now there's a wave. Um, they repair old instrument. Old means later 19th century and early 20th century. Um, and then they use the silk strings. Um, but the, 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 the technique of the silk make making the silk strings in China still not there yet, so they are mostly use the Japanese uh, yeah, maker yeah. to use, to make the silk strings oh. much stronger. Um, so China um, lost that, that technique to, to make the silk strings, so there's a gap. Okay. So actually I'm going to back next month to working on the silk strings with all the instruments. I see, okay, yeah. so it's the same thing like the Gu Qin. My second question is, I, I I remember a long time ago, I saw the YouTube have one gentleman talking about that he played pipa use the five strands. I, I, is something really true? <laughs> because I only see the four strands. Oh, so in the, the in, the, in the history, pipa has five strings and four strings in Tang Dynasty, which is 2,000 years ago. And if you, if you go to the cave, Dunhuang Cave, Mo Gao Ku, Dunhuang Mo Gao Ku, you still will see those two instruments side by side existed. So that's the evidence existed. Two different type of lute actually exist in China, hold like this, both instrument, four strings and five strings. And uh, somehow, um, Ming, you know, Ming, uh, Yuan, Ming, Qing dynasty, somehow the five strings got lost, kind of a fade away, and then the four strings people kept until today. And especially in Qing dynasty, 19th century, um, this is the version of the 19th century, basically. Um, so right now they're replica, they're, they're making sort of I imitate those five strings, but really it's a modern instrument. To me, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, can I ask, when you compose your own music, what notation system do you use? Uh, do you use Jianpu or Wu Xianpu? And also, uh, can I ask, uh, so as, um, 
um, just like, because now most young composers, like uh, we only read or like we only write in five line notation system. So in what way do you see this like uh, five, five line notation si uh, system has helped um, that, or like in, in, in another word, uh, just to liberate the potential of PIPA and in what way does it restrain uh, the potential of PIPA? You can answer that question. I think his interest is oh, when you compose music, do you start to use five line notation now or do you still go back and forth between? Go back and forth between. But for me, I compose, I'm not like a really like a lazy, com you know, that's the composer. I'm an amateur composer. Um, but I just write for myself. To me, I basically I play, I improvise on my instrument and then record it. And then later on, I take it down. Mm. So that could be f Chinese notation or Western notation. Mm. Yeah, but basically I just, I hear first, I and then I wrote it down. Yeah. Okay. Maybe Thank iPhone you. is the first thing. iPhone is the first thing. He's got his hand up quite a bit. Yes, the yes, microphone. there is a lady over there. Um, let's pass the microphone over there. Thank you. Is there any more question on this side? Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Liang Lei and Master Wu Ma and Master Steven, and it's a wonderful opportunity to see you interview each other. And so many wonderful like sparks on the stage and to, um, to learn and inspire from you. Um, so I have a question for Master Wu Ma about um, what's the secret of connecting PIPA with the world music, uh, musically and culturally, um, to achieve like harmony for both uh, music and also cultures? Steve, can you answer that? Oh, no. <laughs> this is yours. <laughs> <laughs> what is the... PIPA is part of world music. It's part of the culture, world culture. Maybe I would put something, just this instrument is so interesting, unusual, even for Chinese instrument. This is not a Chinese instrument, right? PIPA itself came from Persia and came to China fourth century, fifth century became very popular, and then it became a Chinese instrument. Now we think of Wuman representing Chinese culture, but in fact, this is the Persian instrument. Yeah, but this is really the story of Pipa, and that's why I think Wuman's story is the Pipa story, because this kind of cosmopolitan view of what music can be, what it, the place for this music is very much like your journey, your life journey, and Pipa is taking that journey with her. And may I add to that, because I play an instrument also that comes from basically everywhere in the world, we play together in Ojai, and, and I, don't, I don't take reviews, good, bad, or otherwise, to heart, but there was one that I objected to, which was the characterization of our performance as a sort of Eastern versus Western mentality. But when I look at the instruments that I'm playing, there's a marimba, which comes from African culture and from Latin culture, which has been changed because it's in equal temperament, but essentially comes from that. I have five pieces of Purple Heart that come from a lumber store uh, on Convoy, um, a bass drum, which, and there are drums in every single culture. There are cymbals which are in the near Middle East. And so it, it's not that there's not a cultural component to what we do, but I, oftentimes it's misunderstood because it's so siloed. And when you actually listen to the sounds, you realize that people from all over the world have reached for the materials that were at hand and have made materials that allowed them to speak the languages that they wish to speak. And there's almost nothing that is, especially in the world I come from, that is categorizable as from here, here, or here. And so I, I just would ask when we hear the piece, which I think is coming up fairly soon, that we think of this as a, a, an ether of communication and a way in which two people can speak to one another through sounds that kind of transcends those, um, whatever the political lines on a, on, a, on, a, on a map might be. Thank you so much. Uh, can you please talk about the wood uh, that's on the instrument? It looks like there are different types of wood, and has there been experiments on which type of wood is the best for the pipa? Um, yeah, there's two pieces of wood. The back wood is one piece, lao hong mu. Um, it's, it's a rosewood, is that in Chinese, uh, in English, it's a rosewood. 
Same yeah, as the, the same as yeah, it's a strong, very, very strong wood. Um, but um, this wood not not like redwood, but and not like from California redwood. It's from uh, um, Southeast Asia or China. This is Lao Hong Mu and one piece. That's why heavy. Um, and in the front, um, it's kind of a pine tree, Tong Mu, um, soft. So this is like a, it's not like a guitar. There is there is a hall here. You know, you produce a sound. Um, so that's why the sound sounded very differently. And the, all the frets are made by, by uh, so, uh, uh, bamboo, bamboo frets. Um, that's it. Um, so that's why the sound is, it's not like a guitar, it's coming in, it's boom. guitar is like a box, right? It's boom. But pipa is like a band, very different sound. Thank you. I think we'll have one last question, and I'll be. Um, I did see a hand right there. Yes. Okay. Great. Hi. Um, I also play pipa. Uh, I started learning it when I was young, and then I grew up in China. So, like hearing you play is really inspiring. Um, it's really great to see you like here. Uh, I guess my question will be a little bit personal. Um, my question was like, how's the transition? from kind of like learning and playing people in China and then bring it to like a worldwide stage, like bring it to the international um, stage. And then the second question was, uh, wait, let me think about it. I'm so nervous right now. <laughs> um, that was a great question. Why don't you? Uh, hmm? You want to answer? No, no, no. <laughs> if she wants to think a little bit more, maybe we can uh, answer the first question was, first. Just how, um, you, you, can yeah, you can repeat the first question one more time. <laughs> okay. Uh, my first question was, how is the transitioning like, between like, kind of like learning and playing pipa in China and then like, bring it to a, like, the international stage? Oh, I'm not sure international stage, but um, <laughs> it's like any, it's like any, other, uh, any other musician, like Steve, too. It's when you, something you, enjoyed it, you loved it, you hold on in your life, and you think this is a fit you, because I'm not mathematic, I'm so bad at it. So I only think I love music, I like arts, so this is me. Um, but if you like it, you hold on, you keep doing that. Just you, you believe yourself, and then you're looking for um, how can I go further? How, um, that's, that's, probably what I've been doing. Somehow, you suddenly feel like, oh, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, but not, but you just, you have to continue doing that. My dad will be very happy to hear I, what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should, if you don't have, do you have your second question ready? <laughs> oh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I'm already answered. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, very, very good. So how about uh, let's transition to a performance. This will be the end of today's talk. So uh, give us the time to to reset the stage. It's about two minutes. Yes. Yeah. And. Okay. Okay.
Thank <laughs> you.